Tonight, we get to explore the life and leadership of a lawyer, business leader, philanthropist, and a beacon for the overseas Filipino. Join me tonight for under half an hour to explore and inhabit the world of Loida Nicolas Lewis. Loida, thank you so much for hosting us in your lovely flat. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, listen, it's such an interesting story. But like with all great stories, we want to start at the beginning. Uh, we want to talk about your childhood, the environment you grew up in, and especially your family influence. So let's talk about your early days in Sorsogon. Growing up in Sorsogon is uh, almost idyllic. At then, we were you know, less than 5,000 probably in the entire town. And I, I, w I went to public school. My father wanted me to have the best education. And at that time, the private school were below par. And I was so glad I went to public school because I got exposure to, you know, people Different of all. Of life, yes, yes, exactly. Yes, at, but at that time I didn't make any distinction. So they were friends, and it's in hindsight I I am just remembering that some of my classmates only had bakya or wooden you know, slippers. And so uh, you know, my my childhood was uh, the best. I would think it was like an, an immediate immersion already. But uh, what's also wonderful about it, side by side with a loving family and an entrepreneurial family, that also ended up forming your sense of, I guess, responsibility and enterprise. Tell us about your father's furniture business, how he involved you and your, and, and your family and your siblings in the business itself. Well, actually, when we were growing up, my father's business was Nicholas Furniture. He shortened it to Nickfer, making furniture. So Monday to Thursday, he would be in Manila. And Friday, Saturday, Sunday, he would come to Sorsogon. And so that's always a feast because he would bring food, lanzones or mango. From the big city, right? Yes, <laughs> yes, from the big city. So we would have always, uh, you know, parang fiesta when he comes. He is very entrepreneurial. And so when I was growing up, making deals was like, you know, ordinary. And my mother was ent uh, entrepreneurial too. She studied uh, pharmacy, so she had her botica, her store. So, you know, my father was continuously starting businesses so we had a bowling alley and pool, pool um, you know, recreation, and we had a movie house named after me, Lloyda Lewis. You've come full circle and put up a microfinance foundation. How much of your formation when you were a child have you remembered and imparted now that you're getting into uh, setting up livelihood centers through your microfinance foundation in the province? Well, I think it's very much my father's history. He was poor, mean, meaning to say he was orphaned when he was 11. But when he was living with a very rich uncle in Daet, he had in his mind, I'll be like him in business. And so for me, that's already a mark of, you know, whatever you, wherever you came from, your ambition can be realized by hard work. Moving to the big city, I mean, obviously the temptation to stay in rural Sursa, an idyllic area was there, but what prompted you to move to the big city and also from the public school system into a convent school? Tell us about that. From grade six, my mother said it's time for us to have a Catholic education. So we went to Albay, St. Agnes Academy, yes. where my mother studied. Okay. So that was a little tough, especially for my younger sister, Imelda Nicolás. Now she's Secretary of Commission on Filipinos Overseas. So for her, she was so homesick. So uh, grade three, four, so she went back home and I continued with high school. You know, I adjust very well. <laughs> so that being interna in a convent school was um, great because you know our our classmates were from all over Bicol, so I got to know friends from Camarines Norte, Camarines Sur, Albay, Catanduanes, Masbate. So it was a very good mingling of, uh, of people of the same from the same region. In Saint Agnes, it is a strengthening of uh, you know a, a work ethic. It's a Benedictine school. And so that ora et labora, labora yes. you pray and you work. you work. Okay, so that combination. So I think all through that my six years in uh, Saint Agnes, I uh, placed it into my DNA. Yeah. Well, certainly it was forged further there and, and a bit more entrenched. Uh, did you think that helped you actually as you made your steps towards Saint Teresa's, for example? Ah, uh, Saint Teresa's, Belgian sisters. That was in a way culture shock because I'm Provinciana, prom B. Okay, and so many of my classmates have been classmates for, you know, since kindergarten. 
so I was a little, a little intimidated. And I said, since nobody knows me, I worked so hard in high school. So I said, I'm not going to work as hard. <laughs> so on the first year, my grades were so-so. But then my sense of competition kicked in <laughs> and said, no, I'm as good as Just they are. Just a one-year adjustment period, and then you moved in. That's <laughs> right, I moved in. Yeah. Well, then you graduated cum laude for that wonderful school. And also that sense of activism came in. How did you manage to balance your you know, your studies and your activism. It seemed to be two, you know, diverse forces uh, pulling you apart. But how did that happen until you decide to get that balance together? No, it's really, you know, you can study as hard and then have a social life as hard. So in our case, we were trained also under St. Teresa's to action, contemplation, meaning you pray, and if you're effective in your prayer, in your conversation with God, it should come out into action. Well, social justice certainly was the theme in your life, especially as you transition into law school. Can you tell us about another transition? I mean, from a convent school now to the big state university and the th country's top law school. Tell us about how that came to be. Uh, did you manage your studies well, given the fact that there was greater social activism in the university at that time? Being a convent bred, I almost considered, and, and then you get, you get all of this bad uh, news about UP, <laughs> how, how godless it is, and all that. So at the beginning, I was li truly like a little nun, okay? yeah. <laughs> so, you know, praying before studying and things like that. But then, by the second year, I understood that the UP is a small microcosm of the Philippines. Going to a public school like UP, College of Law, yes. then you have the, you know, the whole spectrum of economic status, but always very bright. With a focus on excellence. I mean, it's, it's, it's so yes. you've got the unity and diversity in that sense. Exactly. And also came like full circle from what you had because you started off in the public school system, all walks of life there, but now you hear the apex of your education with the best of the best, but also a constant education on social class and uh, social reality. Tell us how, how you're able to, I guess, forge that all together, especially with a position like the UP Law Review. I, here you're looking, at, you're, you're looking at cases, you're looking at social realities. How did you balance all that? I think you just do. You just do. Um, always a goal. My goal is to do well, okay? I was hoping I would graduate at least again, <laughs> a cum laude, but I didn't make it. Uh, UP, Top 10% is UP not too bad. is too <laughs> tough, it's too <laughs> tough. I think by the time I was in UP, I was already ready for the world. A little bit, you know, protective of myself, being co a colegiala. But as I said, I adjust, I adjust very well. I bloom where I am planted. When the Vietnam War was very active, we did the first uh, rally against uh, Johnson, President yes. Johnson, because he was trying he, he to get to the Philippines. Yeah, he escalated the war, and the Cold War is now reaching into the Philippines at that time. Exactly, right? the late exactly. 60s, yes. yes. So when we had a rally in front of the Phil American embassy, you know, we were there, you know, <laughs> rabble rousing, and then it ends at five. And then there's another group of the left bringing it to Manila Hotel, okay? And then that's where, you know, all hell broke loose, the first violent demonstration and so that was front news in the united states for my husband discrimination is in the atmosphere it was very polarized at the, especially at that time uh, very polarized and uh, not only polarized it's always because you're black you're inferior and so for my husband that fight was everlasting i mean it was constantly there <laughs> We talk about the U.S., we talk about you know, welcome your, welcoming and getting ready for the world. How did you make that leap to New York? Tell <laughs> us about that journey. That was pure happenstance. I was not supposed to stay in New York or get married to, uh, to an American. But when I passed the bar, you know, having fulfilled my father's dream, he was so glad. So he sent me on a round-the-world trip. And uh, in New York, waiting for my sister, studying at uh, Columbia University from September to May, that's a long time. So I worked. You would say, do you have a green card? At that time, nobody cared. And my boss was an African-American, uh, Harvard Law School. And so, you know, he's good looking. My sister is good looking. So I introduced them <laughs> together. And he was so fast, they went out on the date yes. immediately. They were going on a date. And that's when the fame, the, you know, I've always told this story. Loida, 
do you want to go on a blind date? <laughs> I said, wow, <laughs> yes, why not? Yeah. And he called up his classmates at Harvard Law yes. School, Reginald Lewis. Reg, you know, blind date? Oh no, I'm too busy. <laughs> and, he's, and, you know, uh, that's too bad, Reg. You know, she comes from the Philippines. Wait, I've never dated an Oriental before. <laughs> I'm coming. So I was ready for adventure. He was ready for adventure. Little we didn't know, destiny happened. When you met Reginald Lewis, I mean, you were both, you know, freshly out of school, two lawyers. But then, you know, the calling for business was there. Tell us how you transitioned into the world of business through TLC Beatrice. Well, actually, it wasn't me. I, I guess that's why I married my husband. Reginald Lewis because for early on as I got to know him and I fell in love with him I know that he's better than I am and also in his mind he's going to go to the very top of American so economic society his aim was to be the richest black man in America and, and you know that, that, that's where I wanted to pause for a bit because I think that age of ferment was also happening in the US you were having civil rights uh, issues it was still the thick of things at that time how was your relation? You're both minorities. You had just, you know, gotten your, you know, your 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 residence papers. How did you fight for acceptance? Was it easy for you, as, as individuals as a couple, and and then as business people? Tell us about that. Well, again, again, as for myself, I never considered myself minority. However, in the United States, for my husband, discrimination is in the atmosphere. It was very polarized, at the, especially at that time. Uh, very polarized and uh, not only polarized, it's always because you're black, you're inferior. And so for my husband, that fight was everlasting. I mean, it was constantly there. In fact, one of the pictures he loved is a drawing of a man whose head is in a vice. He said, that's what he feels. Can you imagine that? Tell us how you were able to impart that your daughters who you know by all for all metrics were very successful both of them graduating cum laude from Harvard so tell us about that journey of motherhood also okay I think it's both of us imparting in our daughter sense of you try your best not excellent hundred percent 85 percent is all right but you always try your best somebody told me don't be e expect perfection from your children because you yourself are not perfect so for them we are emphasizing two things one, respect your elders. Second, do your work. And that means to say, study. Okay? You expect you to be doing in well in school. So your room is dirty and uh, it's OK. You color your hair green, that's all right. But respect your parents, respect the elders, and you know, good grades. And so that's basically how you know, those values that we imparted on our two girls. When Reginald passed away, what decisions did you make in terms of having to move on and, and strengthen yourself for a life without the love of your life to your partner? I did not move on immediately. You know, it was so hard that uh, for, a f for a few days, few months, I could not even say they will be done in the Our Father. But the devastation and the feeling of complete uh, com convolution, I mean complete upside down, was there. I, it was totally you know, we were expected to grow old together, to enjoy our grandchildren together. But, um, so when it happened, you know, I was like, just totally out of it. But then, with God on my side, and then slowly coming out of, of that stirper, then I said, all right, again, my, 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 my concept of you adjust, you adjust, and looking at what I have, two girls, so no social life, just my children, my two girls. Your focus was there I am, well, I'm father and mother yeah. to them. Secondly, his book, because I was writing my book, How to Get a Green Card, okay? And he said, oh, I'm envious. He said, darling, you have a life story to write. So I started to write. I was doing computer. He was doing long handwriting. And when he died, it was not finished. Actually, some of the things that my husband wrote, I didn't know. You know, he was going to buy businesses. He failed three times. And the third time he failed, I didn't know it, only from his writings, that he was very close to a nervous breakdown. It's like understanding his own uh, demons in a very clear way because, you know, he wrote about it. So, you know, that was good. It, it had to be done. And Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun is on the bestseller list. It is. <laughs> Even up to now, in this genre, it's still selling. One of the legacies that Reginald left behind is TLC Beatrice. Tell us how you assume the reins of the company 
and you know, I mean, it's a tremendous growth story as well that you did. You know, you did it on your own as well when when you were on your own. Tell us how the journey began, how you amassed the strength to do that, and what were the results like? Okay, my husband appointed his um, brother, his the eldest, you know, the uh, the uh, on the second marriage, Jean Fugit, and uh, that was so good because I was in no way, any way near even taking the reins. First of all, because he never told me. So it was not in my agenda. But as he, during the year, as I, was, I got myself together, I saw that the way he's running the business was going to bring it down to, you know, south. So I said, I think we better find somebody else to become CEO. So both of us were interviewing CEOs. Yes. And then uh, all of them were white. And this is a black owned number one in the BE 100. And they're all, all asking for a lot of money. So I told myself, hmm, you know, if they fail, then my husband's life work fails. So I might as well take it over. There's one milestone I wanted to talk about. In 1995, you landed the co on the cover of Working Woman. You know, and that was a great example for everyone out there, not just in America, but the world. People, your Kababayans were looking at that as, as a, what a milestone and what, a, what an achievement. Tell us, you know, before that, what were the key decisions and tough decisions you had to make to reverse the path that you said that the company is going on and create that growth story all over again? Understanding that the business has a life. And if you're not you know, contributing, better have a good reason. Otherwise, I'll have, I'll have to fire you or I'll have to sell the company. And that's what I did little by little. I sold here, I sold there. And then by the time in 1997, when we had to make a decision whether the supermarket chain, uh, Frampri and Leader Price in France, whether we should wait another year and make a call, you know, that this is a put of and course. call. In five years, either they, I call yes. to, to buy them out mm -hmm. or the option, yeah. they ask us to buy them mm -hmm. out. And so that decision being made, half of the company was gone. And so if half of the company is gone, then what am I going to do with the rest? sell it. So I sold it piece by piece by piece. And the result is 35% yes. IRR, which they said was pretty good. How did you feel about letting go of an empire that your husband had built? It was that was, was tough for you or, or was the, the practical business sense uh, the overriding thing there? I mean, w w tell, tell us about okay. the tension I was, there. I was a successor of my husband's ambition. Okay. And his goal is to buy and sell companies. Yes. So it has never been build an empire. So when it, ti time, when it came time to sell, it wasn't, I didn't agonize over it. It wasn't mine. I was just finishing the work of my husband. And so uh, you know, we hired the best investment banker. And then my, my uh, team really was the one doing all the nitty gritty. And trying to get the best value for these yes. firms. Yes. And then they will just consult me. How about this? How about that? But basically, they took charge of selling all of the items. <laughs> Although I invested in business, I also invested in a school in Sorsogon where I, where I was born, the Lewis College. Because for me, that's sort of my corporate social, social responsibility. In a way, it's like that, but more that Sorsogon is one of the poorest province in the Philippines. And the only way out of poverty is education. <laughs> A lot of this business experience, this, this personal experience as well, you try to translate it full circle by building more businesses or investing in them in Asia. Tell us about the decision to do that um, and what are you looking for in terms of um, investment ventures and outcomes? Okay, well, this is the sad story because having been so successful in running a $2 billion company, okay, I started to, begin to believe my own press release that I'm so good. And I did, not, I did not follow my husband's own mantra, don't start a business, buy a business. Because all startups out of 100, maybe to five, yeah, the, most the, It's the attrition rate of Exactly, yeah. all right. So I did not listen to that, okay. So I started the business in Bicol and I bought a business, a startup business in China, mm -hmm. all right. Because I did not have the 24/7, which is what is needed. A hands-on approach. Hands-on yeah. approach. You have, you have, you, you know, it's like a baby. It's just born, 
You don't go away and then leave it to the yaya. A business startup, you have to watch 24 seven. And I didn't do that. Unfortunately, both were bankrupt. And so from that time on, anybody comes to me, Lloyd, a great business, how much money? Thanks, but no thanks. Your wisdom is already built in. That's right. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I know that I'm just throwing away money yeah. if I invest in business. So I'm not investing in any business. As I, I, you know, my husband always says, this man who was very successful when he was young, okay, asking him, can you invest in this? I said, investment, no. Advice, yes. So that's what I say too. Okay, no more business, but if you want business advice, I'm available. Can you tell us about um, that part of your life now when you go to social causes, uh, education for example, and more importantly, as a pillar of the Philippine American community, what have you done and what have you decided to do to make sure that that role is lived to its fullest? Well, on, w on the one side, you know, although I invested in business, I also invested in a school in Sorsogon yes. where, I, where I was born, mm -hmm. the Lewis College. Because for me, that's sort of my corporate social, social respons responsibility. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's like that, but more that Sorsogon is one of the poorest province in the Philippines. And the only way out of poverty is education. And so by starting it, that's my way of giving back to the province where I grew up that is sort of responsible for who I am. So I have the Lewis College and one third of our college students are working students, meaning, meaning scholarship. Yes. Okay, so that's how I manage to uh, segue into, in a way, philanthropy in my own home, uh, hometown. Uh, so I'm just a member of, uh, of course, the foundation, Reginald F. Lewis Foundation, that's you know, family. So I'm only a member of the board of um, Apollo Foundation, that's the African-American, yes. yes, very the famous. Theater, yes, absolutely. The theater, okay. And then the uh, Migration Institute in Washington, D.C. Okay, they meet only twice a year, but very active with the Filipino organization, yes. the U.S. Pinoys for Good Governance. Yes. And how do I choose? Where well, I choose what is uh, very current that affects the life of the Philippines. And this is the China invasion of the Philippines. Of so 2011, we did the first rally against China when they were threatening to put up <coughs> an oil rig, a giant oil that rig. That went quite viral, by the way. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm glad it did because, you know, we sing, Asaman lulupig, di ka pasisiil. And here we are, sinisiil na tayo. I mean, they are right on our shore. With all these things that you shared and with all the plans that you have in the future, I wish you all the best. And again, I appreciate you sharing your life story with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lada, thank you. Okay. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to be able to share this journey of Lloyd and Nicholas Lewis in terms of two things for me that I took away. The one is how to break boundaries for yourself and others. And the second is how to build platforms that encourage people to come together and change society for good. Join me again next week as I explore the mind and the moves of the country's and world's most important people. Mm -hmm.